This video is on fossil fuel and nuclear power stations. It is the second video on topic 8 of IB Physics. This is part of the core material, so it's the same for SL and HL students. Take a moment and read the success criteria that we will cover in this video. Pause it if you need to. Okay, let's shift gears only slightly. Let's talk about nuclear power plants instead of fossil fuels, which means we have a different fuel and a slightly different beginning, but you're going to see that they're all about the same anyway. In order to get the most out of this video, I want you to go to the FET simulation, Nuclear Fission. I've got the URL there. I'll put it in the link down below. Please go do that now and pause the video. This will require you to have Java on your computer. Mac users, don't forget, you don't want to double click and open it. You want to two finger click and choose open with. Then you won't have to change your settings. It is a safe, legal version for you to copy and download. In the simulation you've just downloaded, there are a few different tabs. For this first part, I want you to select the tab that says Chain Reaction at the top. I've got a few different things I want you to think about as you go through. Some different initial settings, and I want you to play with, I mean experiment with, the simulation and work yourself through these questions. Again, please pause and get the most out of this by finding the results yourself. Okay, so here's what I'm hoping you found out from using the simulation. One neutron was needed to go from U-235 to uranium-236. The neutron had to hit the nucleus and be absorbed. After that, the uranium-236 would actually undergo fission, releasing three more neutrons. That could go on and cause another reaction, and so on, and so on. The last part should have shown you that we needed a certain amount of mass, called the critical mass, of uranium-235, or that neutron wouldn't actually go on to make more reactions before ex escaping. Now, one other thing. You need a certain amount of U-238 in there. This is where we get into this idea of enriched uranium. You've probably heard in the news we need a certain amount for this to be able to occur, but it's more than what naturally is occurring. If I have to, by physical means, I can get more uranium-235, but there's some problems to that as well. So here's the crutch of it all. The difference between a nuclear bomb and a nuclear power reactor is that we want one neutron to start it off, and every time there's fission, we only want one of those neutrons to go on and cause another reaction, causing another reaction. If you have too many, they quickly go 1, 3, 9, 27, 81, kaboom, that's a bomb. But if you don't have at least one going on to make a new reaction, then it's actually going to fizzle out and it won't actually cause any more reaction. Okay, one more thing you need to go do. Go back to that FET simulation again. This time, select nuclear reactor at the top. Again, I've got a few steps here I want you to go through. Take a look at what happens. Think about these questions. You don't need to write things down, but it needs to make you start to think and go, hmm. So what we had in this part is with these things called control rods. You put them in and basically they're going to absorb some of the neutrons. So we said before we want one neutron to go on and create one more reaction. What happens to the other two? We want them to be absorbed by these control rods. If we put them in farther, then we could absorb more neutrons, pull them out, absorb less, and then more reactions going forward. So it's a bit of a balance between the two. One thing we don't have in that simulation though is a moderator. Now this is actually really important. Think of this as a little kid running down the hall. If they run into you, 
with so much energy, they might just bounce right off of you. What we need to do, similar with these neutrons, is slow them down so that instead, if we want them to become part of the nucleus, turning that U235 into U236, we need to be able to sh make sure it's absorbed. So if we slow a kid down when they run at you, instead of bouncing off, perhaps you can pick them up and, you know, tell them not to do that anymore. One example of this would be using heavy water. You've probably heard about that in the news, about heavy water with these reactors. Basically what it is is one of those um, hydrogens in water, instead of it just being one proton, it has another neutron in there. Again, it doesn't change the number of electrons, but it does make it slightly heavier. Therefore, heavy water has one or more extra protons, sorry, neutrons with the hydrogen, making it slightly heavier. It will slow down these neutrons, therefore making it better and more likely for the neutrons to be absorbed by a uranium-235. Okay, so let's think about what's happening inside our nuclear reactor. This actually looks, should look very familiar to the other one. So over in here, we have an example of the reaction going on, in this case the nuclear reaction. It's going to release a lot of heat when we have fission occurring. That's going to cause some water inside to get really, really hot. We're going to go over here, exchange that heat. It goes back. Notice the water that goes through the fuel rods or the control rods never actually leaves this reaction vessel. Instead, the heat will go to here, heat up this water, to the point where it causes steam. Ha! Huh, again, steam moving, causing the turbine in the generator to turn, comes back out here. Oh, look, we need some more cooling towers. Again, people see those big stacks, big and thick, and say, oh my goodness, look at all the nuclear waste going up into the atmosphere. No, that's the condensing, and that's the cooling that's happening. So not everything about nuclear power stations is negative. There must be some reason why we've created them. It's not just about the storage of the radioactive waste and perhaps safety risks, which we'll talk about on the next slide, but there are some advantages. For example, we're not burning our fossil fuels, so there's no carbon dioxide emissions. They have a very high energy density. So what's so bad? Well, safety issues. Here are a few of the things that we should consider about the safety of the nuclear power plants. If you haven't seen it, HBO has a really good series called Chernobyl about what happened there when the chain reaction went out of control. A really good watch. So, thermal meltdown. What if that does go from a one neutron causing one reaction and gets out of control? Also, there's the radioactive waste. Once we do have this reaction taking place, the products of this, we have both low and high level waste. If those are words that are new to you, please go check that out. Both of them will be around for an extremely long period of time. And by that, we mean not just one or two generations, but thousands of years. The actual mining of these radioactive materials is also hazardous, as well as this technology I talked about earlier about for enrichment takes this uranium and it could also put it into weapons grade uranium rather than just what's needed for a nuclear reactor. Okay, let's start by doing a question. A fission reaction taking place in a nuclear power station might be according to the following equation. Estimate the initial amount of uranium-235 needed to operate a 600 megawatt reactor for one year, assuming 40% efficiency and 200 mega electron volts released for each fission reaction. Well, let's break this down. The first thing we want to do is turn that 200 mega electron volts into joules. All right, now that doesn't seem like much, but it is just one reaction. Let's figure out how many reactions per second this must be, since we have 600 megawatts for the year. Yeah, this is still a pretty big number. 
Now, that's per second, and the question asks per year, so I better figure out how many seconds are in one year. Okay, still a pretty big number, so I need 1.875 times 10 to the power 9 reactions every second. And in one year, I've got this huge number of seconds, so let's find out how many reactions I need in the year. Wow, that's a huge number of reactions each year. 5.91 times 10 to the power 25 reactions in one year. But that, remember, is for an atom. And that doesn't seem like it makes much sense to me. So let's change that number of reactions. Instead of saying how many atoms I have, let's turn it into number of moles. Okay, so if I take that many reactions per year, realizing that each reaction needs one atom of uranium-235. Divided by Avogadro's number gives me 98.2 moles of uranium-235 I need. So what's the mass of that? If I multiply it by its atomic number, which would be in grams, converted it to kilograms, it says that I actually need just 23 kilograms of uranium-235. But... And this is a big, big but. We've so far assumed that 100% of the reaction went into producing the 600 megawatts for the reactor, but it's actually only 40%. Now what you could do is you could go all the way back, way up here. So instead of saying it needed to produce 600 megawatts, you could have realized that was after the efficiency, which means I could have put here 1,500 joules was needed and find out the number of reactions there. Similarly, I can go through and say, because for each atom one fission reaction has occurred, I can take the mass that I've created here, divide by the 0.4 efficiency to say, Yes, I need 57.5 kilograms of uranium in order to create this much reaction. Remember what we said earlier, uranium has a very high energy density. Okay, so let's look back at the success criteria. Hopefully after watching this video and working through the FET simulation, you can now complete all these success criteria.